morning and welcome to Rising. We have a supersized post-debate show for you today with all three Rising hosts on set. And I'm also excited to announce that we have interviews today with the three major third-party presidential candidates, Libertarian Chase Oliver, the Green Party's Jill Stein, and of course, RFK Jr. Now, those are coming up a bit later. But first, Washington is in full panic mode after Joe Biden's performance. That's right. Last night's debate between Biden and former President Donald Trump was a wake-up call for many in the Democratic Party who are now thinking the formerly unthinkable replacing Joe Biden on the presidential ticket. According to Politico, one major Democratic donor and Biden supporter said it was time for him to end his campaign. He said in a text message, Biden needs to drop out, no question about it. The donor described Biden's night as the worst performance in history and said Biden was so bad that no one will pay attention to Trump's lies. Another Democratic donor wrote over text message, our only hope is that he bows out. We've brokered a convention or he dies. Otherwise, we are effing dead. Former Democratic Missouri Senator Claire McCaskill offered her analysis of the debate on MSNBC last night. Let's watch. Well, first, the easy part. Uh, Donald Trump uh, is a liar, a flawed character, mean, a jerk, very unlikable, and that was obvious tonight. Now, the hard and heartbreaking part. I have been a surrogate for some presidential candidates in my time. I know what the job is after a debate of a surrogate. I've never wanted to be a surrogate more than I do right now. Because when you're a surrogate, you have to focus on the positives. But I have said very clearly and very plainly on this network, and my job now is to be really honest. Joe Biden had one thing he had to do tonight, and he didn't do it. He had one thing he had to accomplish, and that was reassure America that he was up to the job at his age. And he failed at that tonight. Co-host of Pod Save the World and regular MSNBC contributor Ben Rhodes said, imagine what this looks like to young people in this country. And then former Obama staffer Tommy Vito wrote on X, why are we talking about effing golf? With uh, respect to that extended conversation over whose handicap was superior, former Biden White House communications director Kate Bedingfield chimed in. It was a really disappointing debate performance from Joe Biden. I don't think there's any other way to slice it. His biggest issue was to prove to the American people that he had the energy, the stamina, and didn't and he didn't do that. And take a look at these headlines from the New York Times which are really, really bad for Joe Biden. Repeated calls for him to drop out. Um, look, there's no dissent here. This was a full-on disaster for the president. Absolutely. To see the New York Times reporting this, so many key Democratic strategists that have been making excuses for Biden when we've been complaining about this for quite some time, right? The right and the left yeah. have been saying, Biden is too old. Get someone else in there. There are reports of him trailing off in meetings and they're saying, well, this is progressive staffers just because they want someone more progressive yeah. in there. No, this is a real concern. I'm not just concerned about his potential to win, which I think is abysmal. I'm concerned that he is the commander in chief today. And this is a threat for national security today that everyone around the world saw that this is who is running the United States of America. Remember when the White House tried to make it seem like if you had concerns related to his age or his stumbling around that that was all, you know, man digitally manipulated right. videos. I don't think that claim has, uh, has survived the night. No, yeah, Corrine Jean-Pierre referred to those videos of Biden in Normandy or at June, the Juneteenth <laughs> celebration as cheap fakes, yeah. uh, which was just an incredible manipulation of language to suggest that um, videos that didn't run for five minutes long and show the entire event um, were somehow altered in some way to give a false impression. Um, but I mean, I have two questions coming out of this uh, or, or two sort of theories that I'm, I'm toying with. And one is that the Democrats knew that Biden was this bad they kept him away at Camp David for a week in preparation for this to give everybody the idea that he was going to be well rested and prepared and on whatever medicinal routine that he needed to be on so that when he did come out and completely embarrass himself, they had the impetus to finally talk about mm -hmm. actually replacing Joe Biden 
or they really had deluded themselves for this long about the president's cognitive state, and they were genuinely surprised by how terribly this turned out. I mean, if they saw this coming, they should not have agreed to a debate. They should have just said, you know, make some lame excuse, and everyone would have complained about it. Been like, you know, Donald Trump lies so much, and it's impossible to fact check him in real time, so we're not even going to do it. That would have been less devastating for the campaign than this. Or, now they said, and he did sound with the muffled and the whispered, he sounded ill, like he has a cold, they should have said, no, he's very ill and we have to reschedule this for later because this, like, this has been so devastating for the campaign. Everyone who had concerns about his, his age feels, feels validated. Um, you know, he, he mumbled through answers that should have been very easy on, on abortion, on, on Trump, on the rights, you know, weak statistically polling wise issue, the only issue where Democrats and Biden are more trusted by, by people on that issue, he accidentally pivoted to illegal immigrant crime. He, he, he invited Trump to pivot to the horrific murder that took place um, uh, uh, recently. His worst issue, which Trump, of course, pounced on immediately. It was it was one of the worst rhetorical decisions I've ever seen in a debate. Well, and then he talked about people being raped by their sisters and needing their in-laws, their in-laws, uh, just really bizarre stuff. And I mean, the, the real roadblock here, I think, is Jill Biden, mm. Dr. Jill, because they went out after this debate to have a little victory lap. And I'm sure you all saw this video where her reaction to Joe's performance is to tell him, great job, you answered all of the questions. <laughs> I mean, she talks to him like he's a disabled toddler. Mm. Uh, and this is supposed to be someone who is who loves this man, who has vowed to spend her life with him in sickness and in health. And it's honestly devastating to me that she cannot see what is happening and has apparently not given the go-ahead for him to step aside. And CNN is now reporting this morning, according to sources close to the campaign, that not only is Biden determined not to drop out, but he is committed to participating in the second debate in September. Joe Jessica, Biden. Pro progressives have to be feeling very, I told you so in yeah. this moment, for saying, like, this is a disaster. He has all these weaknesses. And, uh, and it, it, uh, is, the, is the left taking a victory lap here? No, we're so used to having these I told you so moments <laughs> with the Democratic Party that it's just like, why does this keep happening? We're ready for it to end. I'm sick of being able to tell the Democratic Party I told you so. I wish that they would have listened sooner. But I think what happened was, is you have a DNC and the leadership of the Democratic Party that just picks darling candidates that will embrace their message, which is, you know, we're going to say nice things about supporting civil rights, and then we're going to do the bare minimum once we get into power. We're going to say that we stand up for working families, but once we get into office, we're going to prop up corporations almost just as much as the Republicans do. And you have all of these campaign promises that are made, and we don't get deliverance once they get into public office. And Joe Biden was the, the darling of the Democratic Party. He wanted to run so many times over. This is someone who could speak eloquently as a senator and then we saw his mental state last night and he wants power so badly and they want to support the darlings of the democratic party so badly the people that will stand up for that vision and not have any real values of their own and so what we have now is just this very sad old man not willing to relinquish that power and i think the people very close to him intentionally sabotaging this debate for him they pushed for this debate to happen at yeah. cnn and it is it has become the case where uh, in American politics, I mean, people die in office. We have the oldest, we have a gerontocracy, we have, you know, our Dianne Feinstein, um, Republican leadership isn't much younger. There's no way to clear these people out. They don't get forcibly retired. I still don't think Joe Biden will or can be swapped out unless he basically consents to that, unless right. he says, you know what, I'm done. And you're right that it, it would take a really harsh reckoning from someone close to him, like his wife, to convince him that you need to step aside. Without, without his, his willingness to do that, it's not going to happen. And then, of course, you have the problem that Kamala Harris is extremely unpopular but doesn't want to be passed over, that there's no obvious successor. So it would be, it would be a bloodbath if it, if it occurs, but they have to be looking at the debate performance, the poll numbers, and saying, unless something dramatic happens, Donald Trump is very likely. He was likely already, and now he's even more likely to be reelected president of the United States. Uh, one other thing I, I wanted to say about the debate is because we've all been, I have and both of you, so critical of CNN and mainstream media, and I had so much skepticism of the format for this debate and whether it was just going to be the moderators essentially doing Joe Biden's job for him and arguing with Donald Trump. 
I thought it was a phenomenally moderated debate. I thought it was substantive. I thought the format worked. They they pressed uh, the candidates to answer questions where they did, they didn't feel that they they'd actually addressed the question, but they did it respectfully and it, it didn't get browbeating or they didn't cut people off. Um, I, I thought it was really good. Joe Biden might not have cleared his very low bar, but the CNN moderators I think did. Yeah. I think they absolutely did, and I think something else we saw last night was with Joe Biden trailing off. Donald Trump was not angry like I think a lot of people expected him to be. He showed right. up and he was kind of soft and well mannered, honestly. Disciplined. Disciplined, and we've seen him on the campaign trail giving these very long speeches. He's used to talking about his positions in public, whether or not he'll commit to concrete policies, but he talks about his political positions. But what we saw last night was Joe Biden unable to even say the talking points that he spent days training on. And we watched as he meshed them together. He talked about how we need to end the ban on asylum and we have to beat Medicare. And it's like he had these ideas of talking points and only remembered certain words from those sentences and pushed them together. And I think they made him lose his voice with how much he was preparing. I don't think he ever got to a point where he was genuinely prepared. And really seeing that last night, I think the Democratic Party donors are going to be effective in pushing him out with this extreme of a reaction. Yeah, tr uh, Biden was very hectoring and angry, but it, it didn't feel sincere or genuine. Trump, you know, was angry about the state of the country, but it was like, I'm upset, but I'm upset on your behalf, is I think the vibe Trump gave. Which... Yeah, and, and I think that was intentional. I don't think Trump wanted to go in there and have a repeat of yeah. the first debate in 2020 where he was really going after Joe Biden very aggressively because who wants to be the guy who's beating up on the well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory? I think Trump listened to good advice for once. I think his people prepared him and said, here's what you need to do in this debate, and he listened and he really did pull it off, although it was gonna be very easy to do given the state Biden was in. All right, we have lots more debate reaction today. Like I said, we have fantastic interviews with all the, the next three major third party candidates, Chase Oliver, Jill Stein, RFK Jr. We know you won't wanna miss that. Stick around, more rising to come. Our coverage of last night's debate continues, and we have third-party candidates in the House here at Rising. Chase Oliver, the Libertarian Party presidential candidate, is in the studio. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me today. I imagine a lot of Americans are wanting to hear from candidates outside of the two-party system after last night. We certainly think so. Uh, give us your reaction to what you saw on the debate stage last night? Well, I think what we saw was, uh, you know, Donald Trump doing his standard Donald Trump thing, and then Joe Biden being very underwhelming. I think the lowered expectations, you know, I honestly went into this debate saying, I think Republicans are making a mistake by lowering the expectations so much that as long as Biden doesn't trip over his own feet, he'll see, be seen as successful. He clear, he did not clear that bar. He went way under even the expectations Republicans were throwing at him. And I think Democrats are panicking right now. What issues do you think you know the Libertarian Party and your candidacy bring that were not covered in the debate last night? Well, you know, I don't think uh, we saw anybody you know, speaking up for the innocent people in Palestine who have died from the results of the airstrikes that we saw. You know, I support Israel's right to respond to a terrorist attack on October 7th, but I think what they've done and the way they've done it has created a lot of casualties that were not mentioned last night uh, when discussing the Israel-Gaza war. And I really think, you know, on the issue of being pro-choice, which I am, Donald or uh, Joe Biden really dropped the ball. He had a chance to, he had an easy layup to talk to his base and he couldn't do that. Instead, he wandered off into talking about Lincoln Riley. Were you surprised by the Democratic reaction and the reaction from the liberal media? I mean, we saw CNN in full on panic mode last night. Van Jones, David Axelrod talking about how much they love the president, but it might be time for him to step aside. Frankly, it sounded like an intervention. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what has happened with a lot of the Washington insiders is they've been trying to deny themselves over and over again, saying, oh, he's just stuttering. It's just, you know, it's fine. He's fine. And then when it was brought in for the American people, like we now see loud and clear that there is a real, real need for some uh, change in the Democratic Party. And I would not be surprised if they uh, there's not a huge movement to get Biden to step down. They were both uh, asked questions about the national debt, the economic situation of the country. Obviously, both Republicans and Democrats are responsible for contributing to that uh, problem. I saw in some of the counter-programming that RFK Jr. was doing during the debate, he really highlighted that um, issue, how, again, both Republicans and Democrats are responsible for this. What did you make of, of their answers on the debt subject? Well, I just think, of course, uh, they're weak on that subject because they have no real defense for the fact that they've been adding trillions and trillions of dollars to our debt. Donald Trump added 
uh, more than any other president in a four-year period. So the idea of fiscal conservatism got totally tossed out the window. Uh, I think this is why it's important to have a libertarian voice who's reminding people that, hey, the first way we start paying down the debt and deficit is to balance the budget and to start getting our economy under control and stop with the inflation that we're all feeling. And nobody addressed that. The fact that our debt and deficits are actually driving the inflation we feel because when we print trillions of dollars out of thin air, it devalues the dollar everybody has in their pocket or their bank account. And that's affecting American families right here, right now, and they're feeling the crunch. What is the case you make to voters coming out of last night? Which I think some people expected Joe Biden to perform the way he did. Some people maybe expected Trump to perform the way he did. But I still think it shocked the nation to see their mental state, well, Biden's mental state, and to see Trump sort of speaking in hyperbole, but very seriously. What do you tell voters about the potential future of a multi-party system and its possibility now? Well, I, I think voters right now got to see loud and clear as to why the two-party system is broken, why we continue to get lesser and lesser candidates uh, because of the way the system is set up. And right now, voters are really dissatisfied. And I wouldn't be surprised if we have the most number of independent votes outside of the two-party system in this election uh, in the last 20 years. Like, this is a huge sea change. It's a great uh, chance for libertarians and others to really put their name out there. And I'm looking forward to reaching out to voters and saying, you know, I, I was jokingly saying, I'm under 70. I speak in complete sentences. I'm not a convicted <laughs> felon. I'm your man. But a lot of people are like, wow, that is a bar we need to clear. And neither of the candidates on stage last night were doing that. What did you make of the two candidates' uh, attitudes toward foreign policy? Trump, of course, has been one of the least interventionist Republicans in modern history. He's moved the party away from its very neoconservative bent. Um, but where do you differ from him specifically on on your foreign policy stances? Well, I think his foreign policy is quite erratic. You know, he talks about how he didn't start any new wars, but he also, uh, you know, drone bombed more in four years than Obama did in eight. And so he still exported our uh, values militarily through the drone bomb all over the world. He talks about not starting new wars, but then he brags about selling arms to Saudi Arabia, who's persecuting a war against people right now in Yemen. And so it's a very erratic foreign policy that's not really based in principle. Libertarians, we support being non-interventionist because we know the best way to export our values is through diplomacy, free trade, and voluntary exchange and not trying to militarize the world. And, you know, Trump talks a good game, but he still drone bombs all over the world when he was president. If I can follow up on that, just on the on the exporting free trade and, and that being sort of a driver of liberalizing other countries, uh, we haven't really seen that be the case in China, which we opened up global trade with them, you know, 40, 50 years ago. And we've actually seen them continue to commit a lot of human rights abuses. So what is the evidence for this free market-based approach to uh, to promoting peace around the world? Well, I think if we continue to press for free trade and we tear down these tariff barriers and continue talking free trade with China, uh, we're gonna see them continue to try to pump up and manipulate their currency until eventually that bubble bursts. And once it does, you're gonna see the people of China wanting market liberalization and wanting better practices from their government and tearing down kind of the centralized authority that is in China. I think that's a far better way to attack China economically than to try to put up trade barriers that actually affect the consumers here in the United States. China does not pay the tariffs that Donald Trump instilled or that Joe Biden has now doubled and tripled down on. We pay those things. And so if we want to compete against China, we do it in a fair open market. We let them try to uh, pump themselves up and eventually their bubble bursts. On Ukraine, Trump promised that if he is reelected be between the election and him taking office, he will put an end to that conflict. He really did hit Biden on giving rhetorical support to y Ukraine, defending themselves, you know, to the last man, the, the this really existential conflict with Russia. Biden in the debate repeatedly said, you know, Putin's going to conquer all of Europe if we don't, you know, stand. And and there was a lot of conversation about, well, is this World War III? Trump saying World War III is more likely if you have Biden again. Biden saying the reverse. Um, what did you make of, of those answers? Well, I think both of them are erratic. I think, honestly, either one of these men can bring us closer to World War III based on their foreign policy of, and the records that they had as president. Uh, I would like to see an end to the Ukraine war. Uh, do I think that a president-elect can do that between the time he's elected and the time he takes office? I, I don't really know because there's, that's never been done before. There's no real mechanism to get that done. You have no official authority until you enter office. And so uh, if Trump were to be elected and you were to want to see, I want to see what that really looks like. Uh, but. As far as I see right now, that's just a rhetorical flourish from the, the former president until he gets into office if he were to be reelected. One of the biggest topics last night we heard about was immigration. And this is one of the issues that I think your position is very different from both candidates. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I want to see a 21st century Ellis Island. I recognize we have a crisis at our southern border, but that is not caused by migration. That is caused by government's inability to properly process people who want to come here and work and create economic output in this country, create uh, you know, a prosperity, create businesses. 
That is what I want to see. And so the way we do that is we streamline the process, come through a port of entry, declare who you are, get vetted, come in and come to work. Because when we vet the 99.9% .9 of the peaceful people who want to come here and work, we can put our law enforcement eyes on those who are human trafficking for the purposes of labor or sexual exploitation, people who are creating coercive and fraud by putting uh, fentanyl into Xanax pills and trying to sell them north of the border. Those are the crimes we want to punish instead of people who just want to peacefully come here to work. And we have to simplify the process. It's too complicated, it's too costly, it takes too much time, and now we're seeing the effects of that on our southern border. There are limits to a just process them all policy, though. We've seen that the killers of Jacqueline Nungary in Texas, for example, were both individuals who were stopped by Border Patrol at the southern border, um, received uh, alternatives to detention, ankle bracelets, and then went on to rape and murder this girl under a bridge. So for whatever reason, they weren't stopped through the processing system. I mean, do you have an idea of how processing needs to change in order to make sure individuals like that aren't coming in? Because clearly that's not the only solution to making sure that we're not importing criminals. Well, yeah, I recognize that no vetting process will be 100% foolproof to keep bad people out of the country. There's just no way. If that is your threshold, then we should just have no immigration at all, period, because there will always be bad people in the world. What we have to recognize, though, is that immigrants, both legal and illegal, commit less crime on average than native-born American people. So I don't want to paint every single person who wants to come to this country and work with somebody who came to this country and did something terrible. If you commit a crime like that, absolutely punish that person, and if they need to be deported, deport them immediately. Like That is something we can, well, after they serve their time in prison. But yes, you punish criminals, but you don't punish people who are peacefully wanting to come here and work, which is what the vast majority of immigrants are. And right now they're stuck in a broken system that doesn't allow them to do that. Another um, key exchange very early on the debate was on COVID. Um, uh, Trump uh, hitting Biden, saying that uh, Biden inherited uh, the Trump administration's massive push on therapeutics and vaccines. And then he went after Biden for having done a vaccine mandate. Uh, Trump was pro-vaccine, but uh, against doing the mandates. And they had a you know big exchange on COVID, Trump pointing out that more people actually died from COVID during the Biden administration than during the Trump administration. Um, what is the libertarian view of how COVID should have been handled in a future pandemic? So the libertarian position, first off, we shouldn't have had governors locking down businesses all over the country. We lost so, many, so much economic output because of this arbitrary lockdowns. And we shouldn't be having government mandating medical behavior. You know, if you believe that taking a vaccine is a good idea, take a vaccine, live your life. And if you're a property owner, you can determine determine who can come on your property, all these things are removed from the realm of government. What we had during COVID was on both sides wanting to clamp down on what you could hear, what you could say, and, and what is the recommended information. And that increased under Joe Biden too. So like, uh, for me, get the government out of my life. I shouldn't need the government to, to tell me, hey, you need to go to your doctor, you maybe need to take care of yourself. That's something that's between me, my doctor, my own conscience. I don't need a government bureaucrat and central planners to be doing that. And I don't need them to be spending trillions of dollars of taxpayer money that could have just been better allocated uh, otherwise. On this exact topic, abortion was another one of the big issues they discussed. We had Donald Trump say some pretty extreme things that the Democrats want abortions late term, nine months and after birth. Of course, Joe Biden corrected the record. His answer was filled with gaffes, but he pointed out that potentially if there was a six week ban or some kind of ban passed through Congress, he would veto it, but believes Trump would sign it. If we get to the point of having Congress pass this legislation and you were in office as president, would you sign a national ban like that? No, I would veto a ban like that. I don't support a ban on abortion. I, I support women's bodily autonomy and their right to make their own decisions. Uh, I support the standards of Roe v. Wade. You should be able to receive an abortion up to the point of viability, post viability. That should be done between a doctor who's just saying that the life of the mother is at risk. That is where most Americans are at. It's where Joe Biden was at with the Hyde Amendment too, not having public taxpayer dollars going to fund abortion, which is where I'm at. But he got pushed to the left, Trump got pushed to the right, and this just speaks to the hyperpolarization of this issue. I think this should be down to the most local government, which is your own self-governance, your own individual choice. It shouldn't be a state or a nation state determining your bodily autonomy. I would rather you, your doctor, your own conscience determine that up to the point of viability and post-viability, a doctor should be able to determine if your life is at risk and uh, allow for that. So if there were a, a ban that came through the federal government and came to your desk as president that banned abortions after the point of viability with exceptions for health of the mother, is that something that you would sign? I think that's the Roe v. Wade standard. Yeah, that would be codifying based basically Roe v. Wade and Casey into law, and I think that's where most Americans are, and I think that's where we need to be in terms of body autonomy and the way uh, we respect women's rights to make their own choices about their own reproductive health. After what happened uh, last night on the debate stage, I think a lot of Americans who tuned in might be paying attention to third-party candidates, uh, 
uh, for the first time, uh, seeing, well, are there other alternatives out there? Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in, in terms of your campaigning, where you're going, the Libertarian Party's um, access to the ballots in the many states. The Libertarian Party has been on, I think, every state in previous elections, and I, I, my understanding is there could be some difficulty with that this year. Um, obviously, the two-party system has made it very difficult for alternative perspectives to be represented on the ballot. Talk to us a little bit about your you know, quest for making your case to the American people. Yeah, so currently we're on the ballot in 38 states and growing. We're going to have the highest ballot access, I believe, of all of the uh, independent or third-party candidates. And so that gives voters across the country the ability to choose outside of Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Uh, we're going to be campaigning heavily all across the country. You know, As opposed to Donald Trump and Joe Biden, who will be focusing on four or five swing states, my goal is to get out to as many states as possible, get as many libertarian voters out so we can build the libertarian party across the country when things like ballot access, major party status, help local candidates win their elections. And so this is my goal. So I'm not focusing on two or three states. I'm trying to be as spread out as I can. Me and my running mate, Mike Termot, are splitting the country up right now, traveling all over the place. And uh, I, I think it speaks to the energy that our campaign has. That's a difference that we have, obviously, between Joe Biden and even Donald Trump. Uh, me being under the age of 40, I have the energy, the enthusiasm, the drive to get on the campaign trail as much as possible. I'm going to be doing a lot of early mornings and a lot of late nights, and I just don't see that coming from Donald Trump or Joe Biden, or frankly, a lot of the other candidates. You could be our first millennial president, I understand. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chase Oliver, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. More Rising right after this. Rising's debate coverage continues. Next up, we have Jill Stein, presidential candidate for the Green Party. Jill Stein, welcome to Rising. Hey, Robbie, and everyone, Amber and Jessica. Yes, yeah, wonderful to see you all. It's wonderful to have you on our program. Uh, we uh, are obviously reacting, all of America is, to what we saw on our TV screens last night. What was your impression of the debate between presidents Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump? Well, it really underscored what an incredibly dysfunctional two-party system we have that has basically, uh, you know, prevented a competitive process from taking place until now, especially within the Democratic Party. They are paying big time. And I think the American people are just reacting in horror. They already wanted other options in this race. And I think this has just underscored uh, why we need more choices and more voices in particular, and why candidates like myself, uh, the libertarian candidate, you know, those of us who are on the ballot for a majority of voters right now, why we needed to be in that debate, not for our sake, but the American people have a right to vote and we have a right to know who we vote for, especially when people are tearing their hair out at the zombie candidates being rammed down our throats. Right. We have a lot of Democrats saying you have to vote for Democrats, otherwise you're being a spoiler. I would say a lot of people wanted to vote for Democrats in a Democratic primary. But now we're in this stage of the election where people saw the debates last night, and I think they're considering all of their options. And a lot of people think about the Greens as a very environmentally focused party, that they want to talk about climate change. They're narrowly focused, maybe so, on green energy. Can you speak to some of the other major platforms you're running on? We heard a lot of talk about the economy and immigration last night. I'm curious your stance on those major issues. Yes, absolutely. And let me just say that that notion that the title green describes the party, that's like outdated. Um, I think you can say that pretty much the progressive agenda as it now stands was actually launched by Greens, starting with health care as a human right uh, under a so-called single payer system at the time, now Medicare for All, that was launched by Ralph Nader in the year 2000, free public higher education, bailing out the students like we bailed out the crooks on Wall Street. That was launched by my 2012 campaign uh, calling for a Green New Deal, which basically revives the economy, creates a manufacturing economy again, uh, transitions our economy while creating millions of good jobs that are healthy for workers, healthy for the environment, healthy for our economy, uh, at the same time that we're addressing the climate crisis and uh, cutting the military budget uh, down to size, you know, from this incredibly dangerous, uh, over, uh, over endowed uh, program that we currently have, which is blowing up the world on the verge of nuclear war on at least two fronts right now. Uh, Greens have long called for uh, cutting the military budget at least in half and putting those resources where we need it here at home. And one other issue to mention, which is uh, housing, we actually call for urgent, you know, emergency solutions because half of all people who rent their, uh, uh, their 
their uh, quarters now, their living areas now. Half of all renters are paying, uh, you know, at over 30% to where they are severely economically stressed. We should have nationwide rent control. Uh, we should have a really uh, intensive system of creating so-called social housing, which is done in Europe, which provides housing as a human right, mixed, uh, mixed economically integrated, high quality, uh, environmentally designed uh, housing with built-in green space and public transportation. All of this is very much, you know, a priority. And in fact, you know, Greens have actually set the agenda here. Uh, we have launched these issues that the uh, Democrats have taken up only in name, give lip service to, but actually don't do the job. And on on healthcare. You know, for example, we call for a Medicare for all system, which would cut the waste, the red tape, and the bureaucracy that are built into our current system, costing us 17% of our GDP, and uh, basically uh, the most expensive healthcare system in the world, which does not deliver. We're twice as much as the next greatest spender, that being Canada. Uh, one out of every three healthcare dollars is essentially wasted, and Medicare for all cuts out that waste. It otherwise leaves the system the same, except that it allows people then to have choice over their healthcare provider, uh, their hospital, mm -hmm. their healthcare facility, and covers head to toe, including uh, mental health, dental health, reproductive productive health, chronic care, home care. It does all that while cutting the cost by 30%. The overhead in, uh, Medic in our current system is 33%. In Medicare for all, it's 3%. So those are some of the uh, solutions that are desperately needed uh, by the American people right now. And creating a sustainable and healthy climate, air, water, Etc. is part of the picture, but it's by no means uh, the whole picture or even the dominant element of the picture. We also see that a top two issue for voters is immigration. And a majority now say that they support mass deportations, including a plurality of Latino voters. What is the Green Party's position on immigration, especially when it comes to securing the southern border during our current crisis? Yeah, we have a very different position on immigration. We say that instead of spending billions of dollars on a wall, which actually doesn't keep people out, it does contribute to greater deaths, uh, but it doesn't uh, do the job. Instead of spending billions on the wall, we should be spending that money on uh, providing the civil infrastructure, the legal infrastructure, so that people can be screened uh, and can be then uh, plugged in to working. Immigrants more than pay their way. In fact, they are said to be approximately seven um, trillion dollars worth of economic development over the next decade if they were processed, given papers, after being properly screened, then given papers and allowed to work. Then they are a huge economic boon that our communities would be competing for. But let me say also, the most important thing that we talk about for addressing the crisis of immigration is to stop causing it in the first place. Because if you look at what's driving people to migrate, you know, it's several crises that we have been, uh, shall we say, leading the way on, including regime change operations, uh, economic uh, predatory um, corporate interference in uh, other economies, the drug wars, which create basically the uh, cartels and make them economically profitable. Uh, that is this whole system of uh, making drugs illegal. We advocate treating substance use as a public health problem rather than a criminal problem, which will then uh, basically yeah. pull the rug out from under the violent cartels, which are dro driving so many people over the border, and for us to actually address the climate crisis, which is a major uh, cause of migration right yeah. now as well. Yes, and Dr. Stein, before we have to let you go, obviously I want you to uh, respond to what you heard from the candidates last night on, on foreign policy on Israel specifically. I know Biden has come under so much scrutiny from progressives, from aspects of his own base, from Arab Americans in the pivotal all over the country, but including in the pivotal state of Michigan, which he must win. Uh, Trump has not said anything very specifically on this subject and was prompted to last night and then ended up not saying very much. I think both candidates wanted to avoid this issue uh, in, entirely. Where do you depart from them? Oh, entirely. 
Um, this is a disaster. The genocidal war being conducted by Israel uh, is basically blood on our hands. The U.S. is enabling it. We are paying for it. We provide 80% of the weapons as well as the diplomatic cover. So this is really blood on our hands. We need, you know, like the American people want and like the International Court of Justice, uh, the uh, Security Council of the U.N., the General Assembly, uh, the International Criminal Court, all support a, a a diplomatic solution in uh, in in accordance with international law and human rights, which are being massively violated here. This did not start on October seventh. This has been going on essentially for seventy five years. That ethnic cleansing has unfortunately was baked into the plan. And I say this as a person of Jewish background, you know, who's been uh, somewhat familiar with these issues for a long time. Uh, there were national archives in Israel, uh, historic archives that became available in the nineteen nineties and completely changed the understanding of what's going on here. There's been essentially, you know, a campaign of terror conducted against Palestinians uh, since the Zionists came. Before they did, Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived together in peace. And when the Zionists came, they drove out not just the Muslims, but also the Jews and the Christians. You know, this is a problem of Zionism. It should not be conflated with anti-Semitism. It's really a miserable uh, commentary on the state of our civil liberties, our freedom of speech, and so on that discussion of this issue has basically been been uh, shut down. We saw that last night, although Trump did say, you know, that uh, uh, that the Israelis should be allowed to, quote, finish the job, close quote. So he was expressing, you know, as he has previously, absolutely uh, violent and uh, genocidal uh, notions himself. So, you know, it's not like one is a better choice than the other. The American people should not be limited to these two candidates, one a rather uh, psychopathic uh, uh, xenophobe and, and demagogue, and the other something of a, uh, of a dementia patient. You know, we should be allowed the full choice uh, that we have. And actually, you know, as you may or may not be aware, the Democrats are really going to the mat in order to try to suppress their choices. They've hired an army of lawyers. They are in the process of trying to throw us uh, off the ballot. Um, uh, they've also advertised for infiltrators and spies, you know, so they're pulling out all the stops. I encourage people to go to jillstein2024.com and check out your other options because there are uh, adults in the room here and they, you know, they badly need to be lifted up and the American people should be empowered to make choices that actually address our critical needs because at the end of the day, it is the American people who are really, uh, you know, paying to the hilt right now. We've heard more policy positions that are concrete in these few minutes than in probably all of the debate last night. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Jill Stein. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Take care. Stick and stay. We've got more debate coverage for you just coming up next. We are continuing with our post-debate coverage here at Rising. A lot of people in Democratic world concerned about the performance they saw last night. Let's play one clip that had raised some alarm bells making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person uh, eligible for what I've been able to do with the uh, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look. Joining us now to share his insights is Michael LaRosa, who was press secretary to Dr. Jill Biden. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, so give us your reaction to what you saw last night. So I, uh, I worked for the First Lady, as you said, for about three years uh, on the campaign. I traveled with her and in the White House, traveled with her for two years all over the country, all over the world. Inside the Biden bubble, you become like a small little family. Um, I have to say, it felt a little bit like what my boss said that one time that got her in some trouble, but it felt a little bit like a gut punch. Mm -hmm. Just wasn't expecting it. Um, it's, it's hard to really extrapolate from there, but uh, as a Democrat, you know, I understand why people are worried, but my heart sort of broke for her. And as you, <clears throat> I, you guys, I'm sure feel this way about some people that you've worked with when, when they're hurting, you probably hurt for them. So a lot of people are going to be wondering if, it, questioning the strategy to, um, to not have Biden do more media interviews. I mean, so many of the American people, I think, are waking up tomorrow, uh, to more, th this morning after what they saw last night and uh, having had no idea that his ability to communicate had gotten this bad. I mean, actually, the White House, all of the messaging lately has been, it's all digitally manipulated videos. The media is lying to you about this. There's no problem. 
people now can see that is plainly not true. Are there any? Uh, are there people in Democratic strategist circles saying, you know, what were people, what were our people thinking by letting it come to this? I, I think there are. Yeah, I'm sure there are. Um, I've heard from people who who have said that. Um, but yeah, I think had people, had viewers, had the audience, had the press, you guys, had you been more conditioned over the last year to seeing him communicate with you, with voters, with uh, other members of the press, engaging in back and forths, um, sparring more of it. Um, I've said for a long time I thought he should be doing more public appearances and engaging more. Ultimately, uh, public opinion is formed through you guys and, um, and through the press. And if you're not using the press, he has it at his disposal. He can use the office. Uh, President Trump used it at every, every chance he had to talk to the press. Um, and, you know, he may have say, said things about the press, but he used the press all the time to get his message out and to, t and to talk and to communicate with voters. I wish President Biden had been doing more of that over the last year, and I've been pretty vocal about it, but I think now you're seeing a lot of people come around to that idea that, um, you know, had we been more conditioned to, to seeing him over time, wouldn't have been so shocking last night. But is it the right answer to condition the voters to accept something that's clearly unacceptable? I mean, is it just a problem where we needed exposure therapy or is the problem really that Joe Biden is not up for another four years? So it's a fair question. It just wasn't my experience that he wasn't able to do the job. And I still think he is very able and I still think um, you know, in terms of substance last night. And I said this all week that he would run circles around Donald Trump on substance, on the record, on compare and contrast. He's been debating for 50 years. He knows all these issues. Uh, it was always going to be a test of presentation and agility. Um, and he just he he didn't he didn't pass that test last night. Uh, do I think he's capable of doing it? Sure, I personally do. But his job isn't to convince me, it's to convince the press and the voters, and I don't think he did that. And so I'm curious what the purpose would be of doing these additional engagements. It sounds like when he was holed away in Camp David, they were really going over talking points because it seemed that he was trying to remember them while he was speaking, and we got pieces of them. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a preparation that might have been more effective is getting him to speak from the heart on the issues with whatever information he has on them in his own brain and get yeah. used to reacting acting organically yeah. to the questions being asked rather than trying to regurgitate talking points right. he was trained on. Was this more of an issue about how Biden was prepared by his staff than anything else? Well, it's hard to say, and I don't want to like Monday morning quarterback uh, right. former colleagues or, or the president's advisors. However, you know, one of the things that I, I had been saying this week when people were asking, you know, like, what should you expect? What, he, what should he be doing to prepare? It's like... It, he knows all the issues. He doesn't need to read more briefing books, right? His test was going to be presentation. So was he being prepared and was he assimilating, expecting the unexpected? Was he running through organic reactions to things that he might not expect or out of the box questions? The, that's what I would have been doing with him. Uh, as a former producer, that's what I would have told him to expect uh, from Donald Trump. Because, I, and I know that his advisors are brilliant at prepping people for debates. But prepping somebody for a debate against Donald Trump is uh, very different than prepping someone for a debate against a, t a, t a conventional uh, candidate. In the pages of the New York Times and on cable news now, there are uh, mainstream media figures and top Democratic aligned pundits um, raising the possibility of Joe Biden stepping aside and there being a different candidate. Do you think there is any chance those conversations are being had now with Joe Biden by those closest to him? Is he being urged to step aside? Is there any reason to expect he would consider that? Because I, I don't think there will be any replacement without his explicit <coughs> consent to, be, to, to agree that he should not be the candidate. Do you think those conversations are happening with him and there's any way that would happen? I don't. No. I do not. No. I think, it's, I think we're far, far past that. So time. instead the team is saying, you got to do a better job next time and let's get ready for that? I think that's exactly what they're saying. Yep. Um, you know, I have a lot of affection for the family, a lot of people there, um, particularly uh, Dr. Biden. And uh, one of the things about understanding the Bidens is I mean, it's all in the public record. You can read all about them uh, because they've been around a long time. But um, one of the things to understand about them that is very real is that when they feel pressured, when they feel their hands are forced or when they feel um, he's being counted out, 
um, that they will double down, mm. and they've always doubled down. And I, I, I she's, she's not, uh, she's, um, the first lady is not a natural politician. She is an introvert by nature. She's shy. She doesn't really like politics. Uh, everything she does, she does because she loves him. She really doesn't, she has her own life outside of it. Uh, and um, she always had. So everything she does is for him. And when she sees that he's being underestimated and pushed aside, uh, as a wife, she doesn't like it. Um, I wouldn't probably like it either. And I think my, my, my own speculation is um, the time last uh, fall or the fall, uh, fall of 2022, you know, most of Washington was embracing for a, a, a big Republican takeover. And they were going to have a lot of decisions to make, hard decisions to make uh, over Christmas and Thanksgiving. And um, I think the, the White House, I think the family felt because of a really shocking overperformance by Democrats in the midterm election that nobody was expecting. Um, they felt very validated and affirmed by everything he had been doing for the country since um, he inherited the office and that he was the only one that could probably beat Donald Trump. I think that that thinking is probably what scared a lot of Democrats who may have considered running and challenging him away. Um, we are a party that's pretty adhe ad adherent to the establishment. We are team sport, and you get punished when you when you don't toe the line or when you try to, you know, uh, take a shortcut to your future, or whether that's a candidate or or whether you don't, you know, regurgitate the talking points. You know, mm. and they, this happened. Let me make it clear. But I think I think had that midterm gone the way people had predicted, which was you know, look, forty year inflation. 40-year record inflation, there's no way, like, this is going yeah, to be Yeah, I, I expected a red wave, and, and there's no way. Yeah, there's and no um, it's true. I think it was so shocking to the system for everybody politically, yeah. the mechanics had been upended, that um, they were like, we, we need to do this. Now, this debate happened, and we have Biden with astonishing low favorability ratings, but it happened before the Democratic National Convention. Mm -hmm. And while the people close to Biden, his wife and the likes, are supporting him in his decision that he wants to run in 2024 because he really feels he's the only guy that can defeat Donald Trump, mm -hmm. or whatever the reason is, mm -hmm. there are people within the Democratic Party who are willing to use their position as delegates to potentially show up to the convention supporting someone else. What do you make of that effort within the Democratic Party? Well, I, you do that at your own peril. It depends who you are. I mean, if you're a delegate or if you're a, a member of Congress, uh, I saw Nancy Pelosi just come out and said he's the nominee. We're not, we're not going to have a new nominee. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it would probably take something like the Speaker, Senator Schumer, maybe, you know, former President Clinton, former President Obama together as a group. You know, President Obama did try to uh, persuade him from running uh, in 2015, I think not once but twice. Uh, so the Bidens- Persuade you know, him to run. Persuade him not- Not to run. Encouraged not, him not to run in not 2015. Run. For, I think. for Hillary. There, yes. I think there was right. a feeling that he saw Hillary as his natural heir apparent. Um, you know, I, I think that's pretty well, well publicized and documented. Uh, so it would take a group of senior folks in the party like that to to tell him that it's gonna that his continuing to run would hurt the party, and he would have to show him that that's the case. But I don't anticipate that happening. I think like um, sometimes parties are team sports, and they and look political politics is it, it's a team sport. It's it's not fun that it that it has to be that way. It's like it on both sides. Both parties are very similar. Um, there's a lot of punishment and reward. Uh, and so it would take it would take a lot for that to happen. Mm -hmm. I know we're running short on time, but uh, one final question for you on Dr. Jill Biden, who you worked for. Did she ever express concern to you about her husband? Because I think from an outsider's perspective, you know, Jill Biden loves her husband. If I had seen my husband mm -hmm. perform that way on a debate stage last night, I don't think I would be pushing against the detractors to say he should keep running. I would actually be genuinely concerned about his health. Yeah, and so this is her 15th campaign. I think she's probably been through about like six, sat through about 75 debates over the course of her time as a political spouse. Um, I, honestly, I, 
I imagine what they believe, what they truly believe, and what I think the campaign believes is that it was a bad night, that it that one night should not preclude him from continuing on the campaign. Um, I'm sure that's what the, I, I don't read the talking points, but I'm sure that's what they will, there will be something to that effect. Um, look, I was an athlete. I, you know, if I didn't win prelims, it didn't mean I wasn't gonna win the finals, right? Uh, I imagine they're gonna take that approach with, with him and with, with the media, but uh, I'm guessing that's how they feel, is that this was a, uh, look, he does usually, he hasn't had performances like that ever before. And I'm not making excuses. I'm not gonna tell you not to believe your lying eyes. Yeah. It's up to him to pass that test and to clear that bar, and he didn't do that. Um, that was his only test. So I think that it probably was a bad night, but I, I don't think it's gonna preclude him from run, keep continuing to run or well, to end the campaign. We know it's a difficult morning for people in Biden circles, and we really appreciate you coming on and being transparent sure. and sharing your insights with us. Michael LaRosa, thank you so much. Happy to. And we'll have more rising right after this. Stay tuned. One presidential candidate drawing significant support as an independent outside the two-party system, drawing significant support in recent polls, but nevertheless excluded from last night's CNN debate. That man is Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who was told that he did not qualify for CNN's debate despite receiving as much as 10% or more support in several recent polls. Now, RFK Jr. participated in his own programming during the debate, where he answered many of the same questions as Presidents Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And he joins Rising Now. Welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me, Robbie. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much for making time. Um, first, Give us your impression of what happened last night. So many in America are, are concerned about what they heard from perhaps both Trump and Biden, but in particularly President Biden, a lot of the concerns related to his age and mental fitness on display last night, even you know, very hardcore Democratic staffers, deeply concerned, talks of swapping him out. What were your impressions from the debate? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't that surprised by his performance because, uh, you know, we've seen that kind of frailty from him before, but I think it was a bad look for America, that whole, the whole debate where the world's exemplary democracy, we're supposed to be modeling the, the benefits of democracy to the globe. And we have 341 million people in this country. And I think a lot of the world is probably asking, is that it is that really the best that you can do. Um, but I think that uh, it was a, bit, a particularly bad night for President Biden. One of the hottest topics last night was the economy. A lot of Americans are really feeling inflation, struggling to pay rent and their most basic bills. And we've had a term from either of these candidates, and it seems that the working class of America is unsatisfied with both of their performance while in office and are ready for something different. Can you speak to how your position on the economy is different from what we heard last night? Well, you know, the, the force that's driving inflation, which I think everybody understands in this country, is this, this ballooning deficit. We now have a deficit that's $34 trillion. The, the cost of servicing that debt is larger than our military budget. And within five years, the cost of servicing that debt is going to absorb 50 cents out of every dollar we raise in taxes. Within 10 years, 100% of every dollar that we raise in taxes is going to go to servicing the debt. It's unsustainable, but President Biden and President Trump will not address that because they contributed disproportionately to it. Almost half the debt was run up by these two presidents. In fact, President Trump came into office promising that he was going to balance the budget, and he ran up an $8 trillion debt. He spent more money and every president in the United States history combined from George Washington to George W. Bush, 283 years of U.S. history. And then President Biden is now on track to beat him. We're adding a trillion dollars to the deficit every 90 days. And it's being driven by the war machine, which neither of them can unravel. It's being driven by... Um, by chronic disease, which they presided over this explosion of chronic disease, which is now absorbing five times our military budget, 4.3 trillion a year, that's our biggest cost. And neither of them has the capacity to do it. And then 
you know, we could eliminate tremendous amounts of waste in government using AI, using blockchain, but you never hear either of these candidates talking about those things. Um, they're about to change all of our lives. They offer tremendous potential for our country. They're the path out of the debt. We need a new industry because we can't cut our way out of this debt. We have to grow our way out of it. We have to grow GDP. And that new industry is the best, has the best potential as AI and also blockchain. But we're driving those out of the country. And neither of these candidates ever talk about either the peril or the potential of those new technologies. You said in an interview last night on News Nation that you would be open to replacing Joe Biden on the Democratic ticket. Has any high level Democratic official reached out to you since you expressed that openness? And do you expect them to, given how hard they've gone against allowing you to participate in their primary and excluding you from the debate stage? No, I, I'm not holding my breath. I. <laughs> Um, you know, we're running our campaign. We're going to be on every ballot by the beginning of next month. And, you know, I think that the Democratic Party now, the super delegates particularly, are controlled by the big corporate donors. And I think that those corporate donors um, would probably prefer to have Donald Trump as president than to have me as president. I think for the same reason that they didn't like Bernie Sanders. I think I'm... 10 times greater threat to to the status quo than Bernie Sanders was. Hmm. And we should mention that you obviously were not in the debate um, last night with the CNN said the criteria was going to be 15% per, support in four recent polls, kind of mimicking the debate commission's uh, criteria, even though the debate commission has been thrown out and uh, Trump and Biden both said we're not doing that. And it seemed like actually they could make whatever arrangement with CNN they wanted. And you did have uh, that level of support in at least uh, uh, three polls. It was as close as it can be. You've pointed out that, you know, if the, if the criteria is you have to actually be um, uh, qualified in enough states to get to 270 electoral votes, well, Biden and Trump aren't the official nominees of their parties yet. So uh, how, how do they count? Um, what do you make of, of the excuses uh, to keep you um, out of that debate at a time where millions of Americans are expressing profound dissatisfactions with the two choices put before them? Yeah, and it, you know it was arbitrary because CNN. We we actually submitted five polls to CNN that qualified of me at fifteen percent or over, including CNN's own poll from April. Um, we we submitted the uh, Harvard Harris poll, and CNN told us we're not going to count that company because we never do. We sent them a reel of uh, of their announcers talking about Harvard Harris polls. Uh, so that was disingenuous. But on their list of the 12, 12 qualifying polling firms was Monmouth, and we qualified on a Monmouth poll, and they arbitrarily threw that out. So they did not want me on this stage. Um, I think it's bad for our country. I think, you know, the, the uh, listen, President Biden was was uh, was ridiculing Vladimir Putin because he won by 88 percent of the vote in Russia, and and he said that Vladimir Putin won because he was he could control the media in Russia, and because he wasn't letting his political opponents on the ballot. And that's the same thing that's happening here in this country. The Democratic Party is apparently going to sue me in every state. This is what we now have, have just learned. And they they control the, the media. I mean, this is the first time in American history since my uncle cut the first uh, televised debate in 1960. Since then, the debates have always been run by a neutral organization, but by the League of Women's Voters for the first 25 years, and for the last 25 years, I, the a presidential Com debates commission either of those organizations i would have gone on the stage but they didn't want me on the stage so they cut an independent deal with cnn cnn made tens of millions of dollars from that debate so of course they're in us both the, the campaigns are probably are almost certainly going to feed tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars more in advertising to the cnn so the whole thing is this you know corrupt merger of the state and corporate power that uh, you know that I entered this race to 
in protest of and, and fighting against. And it's kind of the worst example of you've got a media company that's owned by BlackRock, the biggest owners of BlackRock, State Street and Vanguard. And there's some of the biggest uh, donors to both the Democratic and, and Republican political party. They own all the military contractors, which are profiteering on the Ukraine war. BlackRock has the contract to rebuild what it destroyed with the government. And really they're appreciate. also, they own Pfizer and all the pharmaceutical companies that are paying for the advertising. So I think Americans look at this web of conflicts and see that, you know, what's come out of it, which is the Biden and Trump duopoly. And they're saying, okay, this system is just rigged and it's rigged for the service, these big corporations, these big billionaires. And that, you know, that's the reason that 70% of the people in this country are making less than the cost of basic human needs. That's the reason that over the past 10 years, 1% of the pop, the top 1% of the population now controls more wealth, owns more wealth than the 60% of the middle class. What's left of the middle class, which is, uh, which is almost nothing. Americans are struggling today and they're struggling because this duopoly is systematically stripping the middle class of its wealth and its equity and, uh, and destroying the American dream. Thank you for bringing that up. That's one of the things my mind immediately goes to when I consider 2024 and who to vote for. It's interesting to hear you say you're 10 times of a threat to the status quo compared to Bernie Sanders. I would say Bernie Sanders threatened the status quo precisely because of his positions on corporate power. I appreciate you sharing more of your positions on that. You alluded to pharmaceutical companies, which in the past you've called Big Farm in the U.S. a criminal enterprise. We saw yesterday the Supreme Court turn over that sweetheart deal from 2007 under the W. Bush administration when his DOJ said they had enough to criminally prosecute executives at Purdue Pharma who knowingly sold and pushed OxyContin uh, knowing that it would end up being addictive and becoming a street drug. And George W. Bush said, no, we're not going to do that. And the Sackler family, who owned Purdue Pharma for quite some time, agreed to pay just $6 billion and there would be no further prosecution. Now we're in a position where a new administration could potentially criminally prosecute uh, those executives at Purdue Pharma and have some repercussion for the opioid crisis that's caused over 200,000 deaths in the past two decades. What can we expect to see from an RFK Jr. presidency in cracking down on corporate power and the merging of corporations in the state in the U.S.? Yeah, uh, you're going to see a real crackdown. Um, and that was... You know, the principal, the four principal pharmaceutical companies have paid $79 billion in criminal penalties and, um, and, uh, and settlements over the past 15 years. So when I say it's a criminal enterprise, I'm not using that, uh, that term hyperbolically. This is what they do, and as long as the penalties are, you know, a mere six billion dollars, that's a that's those are rounding errors for the company. These are the biggest companies in the world now. This is the biggest industry in the world, and they look at that as the cost of doing business. I mean, I, I give you an example: Merck. You know, around two thousand seven, it released the, the uh, uh, Viox, and it. it and Viagra ended up killing between 120,000 and 500,000 Americans of heart attacks. Merck knew that that drug caused heart attacks and marketed it as a pain reliever, as a headache medicine, as an arthritis medicine, but it didn't tell its customers that it also could kill you. And I think a lot of those customers, if they'd had informed choice, would have said, oh, I could get a heart attack from this. I'm gonna take an aspirin instead. And they weren't given that choice. And Vioxx knew it was gonna kill them. We actually, during the litigation, we got um, we got spreadsheets from their bean counters that showed how many people they were gonna kill, what the settlements would be, and then announced in a delighted way, we're still gonna make a killing on this. So they made a double killing and they knew they were gonna do it. It was planned, it was premeditated and it's premeditated murder. 
So they, somebody should have gone to jail. And until we start sending them to jail, there's, uh, they're not going to change their behavior. This is the way you make money in the pharmaceutical industry. And as you pointed out, we're now killing from opioids, overdoses mainly, 107,000 kids last year died in this country. And, you know, I lost a friend on Friday to, uh, to fentanyl overdose. I lost one of my nieces during the uh, during the COVID pandemic to an overdose as well. And we're seeing that, you know, every family in this country is now touched by this. We're killing more kids each year, double the number that we killed in the 20 year Vietnam War, but every year, year after year. And, uh, and you know, these companies, it's now a lot of illegal imported drugs, but this addiction crisis started with, with Sack, Sackler Pharma and, and the Purdue family. And, you know, anybody, there's now two uh, wonderful documentaries that uh, my wife and I have watched on Netflix where anybody can go and see exactly what they did. And it was, you know, it was premeditated murder of hundreds of thousands of people and they shouldn't get away with it. In a similar vein, during your closing remarks last night at your debate on X, you talked about the lack of pride that young people have in this country. And we've also seen that the youth mental health crisis has been incredibly exacerbated over the past five to 10 years. Um, and yet our country prescribes more SSRIs and anti-anxiety medications than ever. How would an RFK junior presidency approach the youth mental health crisis without relying on big pharma to just prescribe more drugs? Yeah, I mean, my Peace Corps program or Moonshot program is going to be a series of wellness farms where kids can go, where there'll be no screens, no social media, uh, no computers, where kids can go and learn the trades. The trades are the one uh, jobs that are going to be immune from AI for the longest. Oh, people are always going to need a plumber to, to walk up your stairs for many years until they have robots doing it. If you need to fix your toilet or if you have an electric outage, uh, somebody has got to crawl into your crawl space. AI is going to limit a lot of crap, but we're not tr teaching the trades anymore. And the federal government is not providing money. They'll pay for you to go to college, give you loans to go to college, but not to a two-year or three-year trade school. And we need to change that. But I'm going to... I'm going to have these farms where people will grow organic food so that we can have, you know, part of the part of the problem with the mental health crisis is we're mass poisoning this whole generation of kids. We have a thousand ingredients in processed foods in this country that are illegal in Europe. We're destroying the soils. We're destroying the environment. We're destroying the health of our kids. When my uncle was president, 6% of Americans had chronic disease, today 60% do. And, and the cost has risen from about 6% of our GDP to almost 19%. And it's destroying our country in so many ways, but most of all, it's destroying the morale, the mental health of our kids. And part of that is social media. There's so many, it's so difficult to be a kid today. And I have seven children and I see the pressures they're under. And they're, you know, they're feeling dispossessed. They're feeling alienated. They're feeling disconnected from community, from society. They're atomized. They're fragmented. And we have to go out as a nation and reclaim these children. We have to connect them to community again, to connect them to purpose, connect them to pride and hope. And that's what I'm going to do with these healing farms. I talked about it last night. I'm going to legalize marijuana federally. It's now legal in this state. I'm going to move it off schedule one because even though most states now legalize marijuana, the federal government cannot collect taxes on them because it's schedule one federally. I'm going to change that so the feds can start collecting taxes. That'll raise $8.5 billion. I'm going to use that money to start healing farms in rural communities all over this country. The biggest industry today in rural America is prisons. And I'm going to change that. I'm going to make it so we're going to have these healing farms. A lot of the people who are in prisons are nonviolent drug crimes. I'm going to move out into these camps. And you can stay there for free until you're healed, till you're ready to leave. And you're going to leave with a trade and a job. And you're right. The, the addiction, you know, the, we have an illegal drug addiction in this country. 
we also have an addiction to these psychiatric drugs that are very, very little understood and, and may not be very effective. 120 million as SRI prescriptions last year, 120 million uh, benzo prescriptions. And then, of course, there's 120 million Adderall prescriptions because our kids all have ADHD now. And nobody's asking why, but we need to change that. We need to end the chronic disease epidemic by ending the exposures that are causing it. And we need to start treating and healing and reclaiming this lost generation of American kids. And we need to then get them into houses because if they don't have houses, we don't have a middle class in this country. And the greatest economic engine in America in world history, the American middle class is being decimated because they do not have equity. And if they, no matter what kind of, of entrepreneurial impulse you have, if you don't have equity, you can't pursue it. That we need to get them into homes. What is your pitch this morning to both Biden voters and Trump voters, to the Bi to the person who supported Biden but watched what they saw last night and can't imagine voting to give that person four more years in office? What's your pitch to that person? And then what is your pitch to the to the Trump voter to win them over to the RFK Jr. camp? Look, I, I'm already beating President Trump and President Biden among young people. I'm also beating them among independent voters, which is the largest voting demographic for the first time in American history this election year. Oh, self-identified independents are about 43% of American voters uh, versus 27% Democrat, 27% Republican. Um, I have the greatest favorability rating of Trump and, and uh, President Trump and President Biden. That means people would prefer to vote for me but they're not gonna vote for me, many of those Trump and Biden supporters, because they're scared that the other guy will then win. So they're voting out of fear. And you know what I need to do over the next four months, Robbie, is to convince Americans that they can take a risk and vote out of hope, vote out of inspiration, vote out of faith in their future and pride in their country, rather than vote out of fear. Uh, the FDR made this, you know, this, this uh, tremendous urging to Americans that we that the only thing we have to fear is the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, and that was very wise. And if we and and if we succumb to fear, we're going to get more of the same. You know what's going to happen if President Biden or President Trump gets reelected? We're going to have more of the same. We're going to have more division, more vitriol, more anger, more debt, more wars, more chronic disease, <laughs> and and you know the continued uh, diminution of hope in our country. And I'm offering something different. If I get elected, everything's going to change. Everything's going to change. And um, if people want that, if people want their America back, uh, they should vote for me. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., thank you so much for joining Rising today. We do appreciate it. Thank you for having me. That was a good one. Yeah.